Welcome to 2018. <laughs> Welcome back, Pastor John. I mean, you know, we can... There, there are ways to exchange pleasantries. Can you believe that it's 2018 already? I, I was thinking yesterday, and I know this will be lost on some of you younger people, so, so you're going to have to just stay with me or ask your parents, grandparents, or older siblings, but, but do you remember Y2K? I mean, do you remember stockpiling like Spam and Velveeta and stuff because the world was about to go, go black? That was 18 years ago. That's a little shocking, I think, to reflect upon not just a new year, but, but the fact that, I mean, you're getting older, some of you. So welcome to 2018. As we go into this year, I want to start by, uh, by saying this. I, I'm kind of excited about some of the stuff that we have planned. See, we, we sat down and, and tried to do something this year, not, not inconsistent with what we've done in the past, but building on it. And, and that something is that our goal from this place in the church uh, for 2018 is that we want to, to teach you, to take you deeper into Scripture. That's our goal. In fact, we put the banner up here. It won't be here forever, and there's one just like it down the hallway, but, but you can see there all of the sermon series that we have planned for this year. That's, that's what those are. Uh, no, there is not one a month, even though there are 12 of them. Some of them are three weeks in length, and some of them are eight weeks in length, and some of them are two weeks in length, but but we have planned uh, uh, the whole year of sermon series. And, and what I'm excited about, it's not just that that planning is done, but, but what we're trying to accomplish. And what we're trying to accomplish is very intentional. It is this. It is to get you in the scriptures. It, it is to get us as a people of God rooted in the scriptures. And so if that's our goal for the whole year, we thought maybe we should start off the year by, by talking about spiritual habits. Because after all, if, if our goal is to get you in the word, then, then we should probably ask the, the question, do you have a habit of being in the word? At least that's the first habit. And then for the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about a couple more that support that habit. So I ask you, do you have a habit of being in the Word of God faithfully? Please don't blow off this question. Maybe we should back up for just a quick second, and we should talk about habits in general. Maybe that's safer territory for you, so, so, I'll, so I'll ease up on you a bit, and I'll ask you this. Do you have habits? Man, you guys are just out of it this morning. Uh, to, to your benefit, so was 8 o'clock. I, I think you all have been like just jacked up on sugar cookies or something for the last month. Do you have habits? Yes. They are all extremely, spectacularly positive habits, right? No. What? My mental image of all of you has been tarnished now. You have bad habits? Yes. Why? I, I, you couldn't hear that, and I promise it didn't get picked up on camera, so let me repeat that. I said, you have bad habits, you said yes. I said, why? And someone over here who shall remain nameless, though I do know who said it, <laughs> said, because they're fun. <laughs> maybe that's true, right? Or maybe it's because we haven't been motivated to change those bad habits. I mean, if you know that a habit is bad, if you know that, if you, if you know that it's a bad habit, I mean, you assigned it a bad habit. I said, do you have habits? You said, yes. I said, do you have bad habits? You could have said, no, I have all good habits. But you said, yes, I have bad habits. If you know that a habit get, belongs in the category of bad, then, then, then why don't you change it? When I was in college, and actually most of my life up to college, I had a terrible habit that some of you have, and I'm not calling you out because I was one of you. I had a terrible habit of like gnawing on my fingernails. Do any of you have that habit? Don't raise your hands. I'm just kidding. Don't. I mean, I, I mean, I would destroy those things to the point that they would bleed and hurt. And I knew 
was a bad habit. They looked awful. They were, they were just despicable. And it, like I said, they, they hurt. But for whatever reason, I couldn't change the habit. I wanted to. I just didn't. And, and then I met this brunette girl in college. Uh, man, she was lovely. Most beautiful woman on the planet. Are you saying I have some ground to make up? <laughs> and Jill challenged me when we were dating in college to beat that habit. And even then, I was like, yeah, whatever. I mean, like, girls matter, but they don't matter that much. And, and it wasn't until we exchanged kind of the challenge. She challenged me to destroy that bad habit. And I challenged her to defeat a habit of her own that was bad. And we kind of held each other accountable in that walk. And you know what happened? She stopped her bad habit and I, more or less, have stopped mine. Right? When we know we have a bad habit, something has to trigger in us that causes us to want to change it. Today I want to talk with you about Bible reading, and, and specifically I want to talk to you about, about two ways that this habit of of Bible reading can manifest itself negatively in your life. Now, let, let, me, let me see if I can group this for you. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about two groups of people. Uh, maybe you are one of the people who flits between groups, and that's fine. Then you can assign yourself both groups this morning. Maybe you find yourself rooted in one of the two groups that I'm going to speak about, and I'm going to trust you to assign yourself and, and ask critical questions of yourself there as well. You with me? You all capable of this? I mean, otherwise, I will get the elders in and we will, we will assign you a group. That was a joke. Laugh a little. It's all right. All right, group one. Group one are those of us, when, when it comes to Bible reading, that, fact, that, that quite frankly, just don't do it. Is that any of you? You just don't do it. And I could stand up here all day long and I could say, you should do it. And you're going to go, yeah, okay. That's great, Pastor. But, but I'm not, not going to do it. I was meeting with parents recently and the parents said to me, Pastor John, uh, our, our child, our adult child has said to us that he doesn't want anything to do with church. And I said, well, what? And they said, but don't, don't worry. He, he believes in Jesus. Does that sound familiar? He believes in Jesus. He just doesn't want to do anything with the church. He just doesn't want to, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't need the Bible. He doesn't need any of that. But, 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 but rest assured, he believes in Jesus. In other words, I, I don't need the scriptures. Now, now that might take some of you who say, I don't read the Bible and put you on steroids, but I, but I want you to see the connection here. When, when we devalue God's word, that there is no Jesus apart from God's word. This is how we know who Christ is and thus who we are. If you take this out of the equation and you disconnect entirely from the life of the church or from the scriptures, you miss out on one hand uh, in the life of the church of hearing the proclaimed word of God where, where God speaks through someone standing up here and, 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 and touches you with his word. There's no good way to avoid the church and, and still be in love with Jesus. They go hand in hand. And there's no good way to be in love with Jesus or the church without understanding the value of God's word. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul is writing to, to his young apprentice pastor, Timothy. This is some of your confirmation verses. I know that because multiple of you came up to me after 8 o'clock and said, Pastor, that was my confirmation verse. See how astute I am? Paul writes and he says these words to Timothy and to the church. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. 
Paul is urging Timothy, stay connected to the word. He, he's then, by the way, going to turn the page and make sure that Timothy also understands the proclaimed word, the, the be part of the church faithfulness. But, but here he's just talking about the scriptures, and he's, he's saying, why would you not value this, Timothy? Timothy, this is all God breathed for your instruction, for your correction, for your orientation. See, see, if we don't value the word, we have to ask a fundamental question. And I really want you to reflect on this. Please don't just blow it off or Sunday school gloss over it. I want you to wrestle this in your gut. Do you believe that God's way, God's plan for your life is better than your plan? Some of you are nodding. Now let me add to that question. Do you believe that God's plan for your life is better than your plan for your life, even if God's plan is ridiculously hard? In John chapter 6, Jesus is teaching the followers that are around him, and he's teaching specifically about communion, about how when we receive the bread and wine, we receive the body and blood of Christ. And and John finishes that section by telling us that many of the disciples decided that that was too hard of a teaching, and so they departed from Jesus, and they stopped following him. And then Jesus spins on Peter and says, and the disciples, and says, what about y'all, basically? I'll, I'll, I'll Southeast Missouriize that, or maybe Texanize that. What about y'all? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Do we believe that these are the words of eternal life? And if so, then why would, not, why would we not hold this in extreme high regard and cherish it? Or as Martin Luther said, read, mark, and inwardly digest it. You with me? Y'all good? Let's go to group two, shall we? Because there are others of you who are the ones who nodded vehemently whenever I said, do you believe God's word is better for you, who have slid into the ditch on the other side of the road. Over Christmas, I had coffee with a young man, and we were sitting and talking, and he was telling me how his life has gotten off track and how he wants to get it back on track, and, and, and on his own, with no prime, priming or, or prompting from me, he said, Pastor, um, you know, I used to study the word faithfully every morning, like three or four hours a morning. And, and that was when my life was good. And now I, I just, I can't get back there. I can't, I can't dedicate that kind of time, three or four hours to Bible study. And so I feel that I'm being unfaithful to God. See, the other side of the ditch is this. That, that some of us beat the living snot out of ourselves because we don't spend enough time in God's word. That this group devalues God's word. That this group strangely also does the same. We, we've turned God's word in, in, into some magic formula that, that somehow we have to spend enough time with it or with a study written by someone named you know, Beth or, or, or someone n named Rick. That, that we have to spend enough time here with them or with this, that, that if we don't, we're, we're not worthy of God's grace. And, and if you're in this camp, hear me very clearly. I want to tell you the exact same thing that I told the young man over coffee. It can be summed up in one word. Relax. Take a deep breath. God has not mandated for you to study his word 700 hours a day. He, he has not given some expectation of personal piety, and if you don't know what that word is, Google it. He has, not, he has not challenged you to that. He has said, listen, value what I tell you in the word, but don't legalize my word. Don't turn it into some mandate that you have to check off your list. Know it, meditate on it, trust in it, but don't be crushed by the weight of personal Bible study. 
Uh, I'll, I'll tell you two things. Never forget that the early church did not have copies of the written scriptures. Now, they existed, they were, they were preached from, they were taught from, but, but Joe Pusiter did not have a copy of the scriptures. What, Pastor? How did they do their Bible study every day? Uh, they didn't. Instead, they, they heard the scripture proclaimed in, in sermons, and then the rest of the week they meditated on it. They reflected on it. They allowed it to shape them. That's the life of faith, not some academic study of this book, but that we allow God's word to penetrate our hearts. That, that we allow it to shape who we are, that our new identity in Christ becomes that which defines the way we think and the way we process and the way we deal with others and the way we handle conflict and the way we handle finances and all of those things. But it does so because it's the living way of God and God's way is better than our way always. You with me? I, I've taught this to you before and I'll teach it again. I think I have time. We'll do this really quickly. If you want to do a fun little Bible study, you can, you can do it on Exodus chapter 20 and Deuteronomy chapter 5. Do you know what those two sections of Scripture contain? They contain the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20 under, remember the Sabbath day. You, you, you with me on that one, on that commandment? You, you all know that one? It says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, or remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, depending on your translation. But, but the key word is remember the Sabbath day. That's in Exodus. You follow? You know what Deuteronomy says? Deuteronomy 5 says, honor the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. What's the difference? I'm not sure, but early rabbinical priests said this was the difference. They said that the difference was pattern your life after the first part of the week, reflecting upon what you've heard in the, in the sermon, in church. Reflect upon it. That's how you honor it. I mean, excuse me, that's how you remember it. You reflect upon it. You, you look backwards through the first part of the week, and you celebrate God's Word, and you allow it to shape you, and you struggle with it a little bit. Maybe you even define your Bible study habits. You, you, you allow it to pierce your hardened heart. And then you honor the Sabbath day, Deuteronomy 5, by looking forward and getting your week structured in such a way that you can spend time with God's people in His Word, hearing it and letting it, letting it churn in your gut. That's remembering and honoring. Notice none of that was sit down with a workbook and a marker and a cup of coffee. Now, those things aren't bad, but don't be guilted by them. Don't be crushed by the weight of that. The key is value God's word. Hear it proclaimed, and then allow it to penetrate your heart. Reflect upon it. Read, mark, and inwardly digest or learn it. You with me? But in both camps, now I'll broaden it. I'll tell you to relax. Because the God of the universe is at work by his spirit through the spoken word. This is where studying the scriptures begins. It begins in worship with God's people. It begins by hearing it proclaimed to us and, and chewing on it. That's why Josiah, in our Old Testament reading today, Josiah was known as the boy king of Israel. Josiah found that God's people had neglected the word. They, they, they kind of left it out of their daily practice. He found these old manuscripts of, of God's covenant with his Old Testament people, and he said, this, this should be read. And so he gathered all of the church together, and he stood up by the pillars, it says in 2 Kings. And he said, listen up, y'all. You got to hear this. You know what he read? The first several books of the scripture to them. Maybe you missed that. He, he read aloud and made them listen to the first several books of the scripture. So, you know, take that for those of you who think we preach too long. <laughs> right? Why did he do that? Because, because through the scriptures, God is at work connecting us to himself and reminding us not only of who, is, who he is, but who we are as his people. So as we begin 2018, let's seek to develop the spiritual habit of being in the Word, not crushed by studying it academically, but allowing it to shape us, that it's reflected upon and digested and produces fruit in us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray, shall we? 
Heavenly Father, God, we give you thanks that you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, that's what your word teaches us. It teaches us that you are good. It teaches us that though we rebel against you over and over and over again, you remain faithful to us. You strengthen us by your word. And so, Lord, as we spend the next couple of weeks talking about spiritual habits and then ultimately try to use those spiritual habits for the rest of this year, deepening our understanding of your word, may we never turn it into an academic exercise or something that should produce guilt in us. Instead, let us delight in it. Let us delight in the fact that all of your word is, is breathed by you. It's breathed by you for our training, for our correction, for teaching and reproofing us. God, it's, it's breathed by you that we may know who you are and that we may be prepared for every good work that you set before us. So Lord, make 2018 and this congregation especially a year of growth and study that we might learn to trust you more and more and more every day as your word shapes us into the people that you want us to be. We pray this in your name, Jesus, and the people of God said,